Hi, it's Lori Neverman from Common Sense Home, and today we are going to be making mead with wild yeast. And I'm doing this with my friend Eric, who's our resident closest we get to a Viking, in honor of the Make Mead Like a Viking book. And I got Eric a free copy from Chelsea Green by saying that we would do this for you to show you how it's done. So, let's get started. First we have a crock. We're going to be making a gallon of mead but I used a two gallon crock because there is the possibility of much foaming. I don't know how this is gonna go because this is the first time for me with wild yeast. So extra room is not an issue. We also have our wooden spoon. Wooden, very wooden. important. Yeah, yeah, because wood is naturally antimicrobial. And we have a gallon of water, filtered water. You don't want to use anything with chlorine, fluoride, anything like that, because that can kill your yeast. Yes, so point. city water is nasty. So I took this from the RO. I did warm up part of the water, but room temperature is okay as long as your honey is already uh, dissolved. If there's crystals, you can warm your honey gently, but you never want to use boiling water, and you never want to overheat your honey past like 114 degrees because once you start getting into pasteurization temps you kill the yeast and that's where i made my mistake well it's okay if you're using commercial yeast because obviously you heat up your water and then you add things let it cool down some and then mm -hmm. add your yeast back into the warm mix of whatever you're working with and then it takes off but when you're working with wild yeast you gotta be a little bit gentle so if you want to put the extra the other the last two quarts of water in with the other two quarts I already put in earlier. This is so exciting, oh my gosh, no, it's water. <laughs> the action happens over the course of the next several weeks. And so it's, we're gonna come back a little bit later and you can go ahead and dump the honey in. And this is from a local beekeeper. It has not been heat processed. They only heat it very gently. It is still a raw product. And it's gonna take a little bit. Now along with this, yeah, we can be patient. I'm gonna get a spatula. Okay. Locally sourced raw honey. Big thumbs up. The skinny spatula. Now, Eric's dad was the master of fermenting. <laughs> he would ferment anything, and he, he was my inspiration for a lot of my odd things that I get into. She's not joking. Anything. Anything. And I, I never got to taste the onion wine, although I hear it was something very special. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, um, he never did ferment chicory, and I'm very, very happy. <laughs> but the chicory coffee, which <sighs> doesn't taste really quite like coffee, but he did ferment that. <laughs> coffee in the... He should have fermented that, yeah. You know he would have. Yes. He would have brought that up. Okay, I wish you could have tasted my quackgrass wine, because that was very That would unique. have been very interesting. Yeah. And to this, to also boost up our ferment, we have eight to 10 raisins, um, organic raisins. You don't want anything that's been sprayed, herbicide or pesticides, because again, that can kill the yeast. Okay. And. These are, they add a little bit of tannin and again, more wild yeast to work with. And let's see, this is what we got. You know, look, I should probably cover the label, but it says organic raisins. And then for some acidity, I have organic lemon. One each time. Eat. And you can use a little lemon, a little orange juice, whichever okay. you're goes to your fancy, but honey and lemon, of course, classic combination. Honey and orange, also good. Okay. And then if we were gonna be making a flower mead, where we wanted to try and catch oh. the wild yeast off the flowers, right? we would add them in this initial ferment, just the petals, not the green stuff, because the green stuff is bitter, and it also has compounds that inhibit fermentation. Right. So, you, like Jeremy says in his book, that he'll start gathering his flowers as soon as they start popping up outside, carefully pick the petals off, freeze them until he gets it in the quantities that he needs. But this time we're just gonna keep it simple. Yeah, I was gonna say, we're gonna keep it simple this time, and then maybe next time in the future we'll get a little more adventurous. Okay, and now we just stir until the honey dissolves. Okay. Yeah. I, I think I can handle that. I'm sure you can. 
Now, how long does this take before it's actual drinkable and mead? Well, we should start getting some fizziness, hopefully in the next day or two, and then we'll do a slow ferment, probably this initial open crack. I got a uh, flour sack towel that I'm gonna cover this with once we get this all mixed up. And it's going to need to be, there's honey, there's honey, you can smell it, you can smell the lemon, even now, there's promise in that crack. Yes, there is. But um, this is gonna need to be stirred twice daily because you want it aerated again when you're looking for that whole cultivating your wild yeast thing. You really make me think of dad right now. Ah, you know, he, his basement was like going down into the alchemist layer or something like this, you know, with all the tubes and the cracks and the, the storage and the bottles of every description. And carved wood spoons, going, yeah. making sure, go down, stir the wine, go down, stir the wine. That's a thing. Who would have thunk? Yeah, yeah. And two, if you're working with uh, fruit solids or the um, petals or anything like that, mm -hmm. you know, they'll, they'll float to the top. So by constantly stirring a couple of times a day, you make sure that nothing sits on top and starts molding. Mm -hmm. Because, yeah, whatever's exposed and not in the, the drink will potentially, you know, start going a different direction with its microbes. So that is another thing. The, Acidity from the lemon is good, and honey is also naturally somewhat um, acidic, so both are somewhat right. antiseptic. So they tend to favor the good microbes, but only if you keep whatever else you're fermenting in the hooch. Okay. So, so yeah, that's how we start, and then I'm going to keep an eye on this for the next month or so, and stirring a couple times a day, and then when we're ready, we're going to wrap this up to a one gallon carboy with an airlock okay and give it a couple more months like that and then we'll bottle and we should be ready for um oh, christmas yeah christmas and all that time winter solstice season. yeah yeah winter solstice because we're sitting at summer solstice right now so a six month ferment is, is okay for a simple meat yes it's a good thing. It's a tasty what thing. is the must the must is that yeasty sediment stuff that your your base of what you're building your brew on okay um so your honey your fruit your whatever that that your yeast based forms your must as opposed to just the water liquid ingredients type things it, it's what you build your meat on okay so i think i'm gonna get a towel and wipe that off because i noticed my edge is just a wee bit sticky so my towel would stick to that too mm. And if you have ants around, <laughs> be wary of fermenting in an open crock. I Jeremy, suppose. yeah, they, they like the sample too. They've got a sweet tooth and a, they like a little bit of hooch. So you can set out some honey mixed with uh, borax and cornmeal and they'll carefully gather it, take it back to the hive and do everyone else in. And, you know, just watch. You always want to keep it covered when you're not stirring because fruit flies love this stuff too. Of course. And, yeah. No I, rubber band or... I actually have a band that I'll fish out. I have some headbands that overstretch don't put my head mm -hmm. anymore. Go perfectly there you go. on top of a nice big crack. So. And that's it. That's it. Wow, that yeah. hurt. That was, that was so <laughs> hard. Now we get to sit around and visit for the afternoon. Woohoo! All right. Thank you so much for watching. And Thank you for having me. We'll be back later with more updates on the Wild Fermented Me. What's the name of the book again? Oh, yeah. Make me like a Viking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're at about the two week mark with our meat here. And it started bubbling in around five days. And then I kept stirring for a couple more days after that to make sure it was properly aerated. And then I moved it into the carboy. Before I moved it into the carboy, I did use strainer, measuring bowl, which I lined with flour sack towel to catch the little chunks. Which this one has been used for wine making and jelly making a number of times. And so I lined the strainer with that, shoveled the mead into there, and then poured the mead into this carboy. Now a carboy is a container that has, can easily be fitted with an airlock. And if you look closely, our mead is still active and the airlock 
allows the bubbles to escape on the top, but it keeps more microorganisms from getting in. So we know we've got a good ferment going with the wild yeast, but we don't want to keep letting more different microbes in so that we don't end up with vinegar. Once we've got a stable ferment, we want to keep that stable. Now at this point, I'm going to leave this in the carboy for several months and I can rack it once or twice, that, that is pull off the clear liquid from the top, leaving the sediment in the bottom if I want and I'll probably rack it at least once and then finally we're going to bottle into either wine bottles or the swing top bottles that can handle carbonation. And that is that for now. I'm going to cover this back up. You don't want to leave it in direct sunlight. So it's going to get covered up with a towel and it's going to be parked in a corner of my kitchen for the next several months.